year, and we're putting the plans uh, in place now for the third series next year. Um, and we have a number of, of speakers already lined up. I can tell you about two who we just confirmed. Uh, we will be having uh, a, a, a professor at the Albany Law Center, um, Paul Finkelman, coming in to speak uh, on is the Supreme Court Jewish or not, or pro-Jewish or not, and sort of looking at what the Supreme Court is doing and, and Jewish issues. He's going to be speaking in the spring. Uh, and in the fall, we have John Matheson, who teaches at SU. Uh, John, in addition to his work at SU, does a lot of work with the UN. Uh, just got back from a couple weeks stint in uh, Jordan, and is going to be here speaking this fall. His wife, uh, Jan is a member of Jan Boston, is a member of our temple. Uh, so we're thrilled to have him and to look forward to a whole series in the fall. Uh, I also want to take a moment to introduce to you our new director of congregational learning, uh, Stephanie Marshall, who's in the back. Uh, Stephanie is here visiting and house hunting. She'll be joining us officially July 1st. Uh, and we look forward to welcoming her more formally then, but it's good to have you here. And finally, a big thanks to Roy Gunnerman. Roy is um, one of our own, Roy's a member of the temple, and if you don't know him, you should get to know him, because a kinder, smarter guy you won't find. Uh, Roy is one of these people who just natively understands things and can take a complex issue and pull it apart and has an extraordinary gift. Uh, he's a graduate both of SU's undergrad and SU Law School, uh, and is a professor at, uh, at New High School, and we're thrilled to have him here. Uh, one little token of appreciation from us to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, it feels weird being on this side of the room. I'm usually sitting at the very last seat. I feel the same way. <laughs> so, uh, thanks. Uh, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to come and talk about some issues that uh, I uh, spent a lot of time thinking about worrying about and uh, researching and some of the experiences that uh, you live every day might not even think about. Um, I'm a former newspaper reporter and a former lawyer and now I teach up at uh, Newhouse School and run the Tully Center for Free Speech. I know how much everybody likes Chachki, so I've got Tully Center Pen. <laughs> okay. I wasn't sure how many people would be here, so... Um, <laughs> you can take notes if you want. Um, but I spend a lot of time with the First Amendment. And how many of you actually think a lot about the First Amendment? Can you name the rights? What are our rights under the First Amendment? Speech. Peaceful assembly. Religion. Peaceful assembly. Press. Press. We got two religions. <laughs> Bear arms. Second one. On one more. How many of you like to complain about government? Petition. Redress of grievances. Petition government for redress of grievances. So there are five rights. Six if you count the uh, the religion uh, clauses for establishment and uh, freedom from state-run religion. So. Think about it right now. How many of those rights are you exercising just by coming into this very room? Most of them. Most of them. Some of you might complain about this speech. And although I'm not government, you can certainly petition me and, and complain. But definitely speech, we're assembling, and many of us are actually practicing our religion. I, with my background, I'm primarily a press and speech clause guy. But I'd be regressed if I didn't at least talk about the religious elements of the First Amendment, because being in a, in a synagogue, it's important to recognize how, how that really impacts what we do. And I mean, I'm not a, I do a lot of reading on uh, Jewish studies, diaspora studies, and uh, Holocaust and things like that. And uh, but, but I'm not an expert in, in Judaic studies or anything like that. But um, I was thinking about it a while ago, and I don't think there's any law ever created uh, in humanity that gave Jews more uh, protection than the First Amendment. And um, that's, that's an important issue to, to think about, because we've all come from so many different places where we weren't allowed to have full citizenship or even uh, uh, worship in the privacy of our own homes. <coughs> we've all found our way to the United States. 
where the government was founded on religious freedom and religious and free expression. And um, it's been a part of American history since the founding. And um, I don't know, has anybody been to the Toro Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island? Uh, one of the famous uh, historical documents they have there is a letter from George Washington uh, congratulating the Hebrew people for their uh, their faith and uh, telling them, telling us that we would have a uh, protective environment to practice our religion. Incidentally, uh, that synagogue has a hiding place under the bima, so that shows you where those people were coming from when they founded it. But um, you know, I, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't at least address that from a First Amendment perspective. But moving on to the stuff that I spent more time talking about and uh, studying and, talk and and really thinking about as far as how we deal with speech and press. And we we'll end up focusing a little more on a recent Supreme Court case that came down a half ago. So these cases are all around us. And it's, it's always developing. In the next week or two, the Supreme Court's going to issue another important ruling on an uh, important free speech case involving video games. And I, was, I actually went to the Supreme Court to hear those arguments, so I'm looking forward to that. I don't know if you meet too many people who are sitting on the edge of your seat waiting for a Supreme Court opinion. But that's, welcome to my world. I don't even play video games anymore, but you know, when I was a kid, we did. So keep your eyes open for that. So, we talk about the First Amendment rights that we all have and you might not even recognize. And how do they really work? How does it really work? It's protection from government telling you what you can or can't say or believe or express. And some of us really do a lot of expressing. Anybody ever written a letter to the editor? Yeah, good. You don't see too many people doing that. No, but that's a private editorial decision. It's not the government saying, your letter not not being uh, printed. Anybody ever been to a protest, rally, protest? <coughs> yeah, we've seen rallies and protests all over the world lately. We've seen government crackdowns. We turn on CNN right now. Wolf Blitzer's in the situation room right now, telling us about protests in places like Syria, Libya, where people are being shot just for expressing anti-government sentiment. Um, these are these are things that are hard for us to recognize and, uh, and deal with, but that's how it is all over the world right now. So, we talk about expression. Anybody an artist? What kind of art do we do? Weaving, painting, photography. Do you have any political message in any of this? Not really. Yeah. Uh, some some sort of religious sometimes once in a while, but not uh, not political. But it's how you express yourself. It's important yeah. to how you view yourself as a person. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Artists have First Amendment protections. Uh, our writers have First Amendment protections. How many of you still read a daily newspaper? Oh, good. News magazines. TV, yeah. the, uh, the internet, yeah. <laughs> Anybody use the internet? Yeah, of course, you can't, you can't avoid it. So that's all protected with, uh, by our First Amendment. And the internet's opening up a whole can of worms. I could spend a whole another hour talking about the international elements of uh, the internet and how the, uh, the web is changing our definitions of some of our basic legal concepts. Talk about that a lot in my First Amendment classes up at, up at school. So we see all these these rights, and they really force us to confront some some some, some issues that we might not be comfortable dealing with. And that's where we go into the, the most recent case that the Supreme Court uh, issued an opinion on in March. That's the Snyder v. Phelps case. Has anybody heard of that one? Mm -hmm. Okay, we got a few. Mm -hmm. We got a few. I'm sure you might not know the case by name, but you know some of the facts. And 
just as a, a primer on the facts. There's a, a, a small church in, from, from Kansas that has decided to mount protests, formal protests, outside military funerals. Uh, oh, that's the military funeral. Uh, yeah. Okay. <coughs> What's, that? What's the name of the case? Snyder v. Phelps. Snyder is the father of a, of a uh, Lance Corporal who was killed in the line of duty in Iraq. Phelps is the Reverend Fred Phelps from, from Kansas, who has a small, ultra conservative, right wing Christian church that believes that all of society's ills can be traced back to certain um, certain viewpoints that there are really, for some reason the fact that there are gay people amongst us that God is that God is punishing humanity with wars and disasters and uh, improv improvised explosive devices and that somehow this is just punishment for innocent victims um, I mean, I'm not a theology expert when I sit in the back I, I'm not a theology expert, but I would like somebody to really explain this to me sometime. I think the guy that hands out flyers on Marshall Street might explain it to me sometime. <laughs> but that's, that's a whole other issue. So, in order to raise awareness of, of these fringe political issues and espouse certain certain viewpoints, um, this church has decided to mount protests outside these funerals. There's no causal connection between uh, the, the, the grieving families and this church. The, the, the grieving family, in this case, had no connection to, to the church. Uh, in fact, the, the, the fallen soldier was, wasn't, was not gay. The family had no real connection to any political movement. But they targeted the, the, the funeral, showed up, and had a protest. And I can read you some of the language of their protest. And uh, if, I, if I offend anybody, well, I walk around in a free speech zone. So I apologize in advance. But these are their messages from the placards. Uh, God hates fags. Thank God for IIDs. And America is doomed. That's just some of the tame ones. So they're outside this funeral. You know, the, the most sensitive, emotional time of his family's life, mounting these protests. Distasteful, at the very least distasteful. Inflammatory in, in, in other circumstances. So this reverend expressing these viewpoints to a group that's totally unrelated to any, anything. What do you think? So, so what is uh, what is the uh, Snyder versus what, whatever it's Phelps. Phelps. What, what what are they? Uh, what, what is the what is what? What's the defense? What was the decision? What, what was the? Uh, no, I'm gonna, I'll get to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not gonna let it dangle out there. I'll give you the, the whole run rundown. Okay. Wasn't there an issue about distance from the church across the street and down where they were? Well, they they were directly in front of the cemetery. They were they were they were down the street. Uh, in fact, uh, the family didn't even know this protest was going on until they saw it on the news and read about it in the newspaper. All right. Seems there are two rights in conflict with each other. You've got you've got it. You've got it. We've got one party's right to to speech and assembly. We have a grieving family's right to privacy and to be left alone. Serious conflict. Do you think there's a constitutional right on the second one? Well, you have a you have a constitutional right to privacy. There right. is, yeah, yeah. The right of privacy is is found in a few of the amendments of the Constitution, so we do have that right as well. What, what about the religious aspect of the funeral? Which whose right? Whose religious aspect? The protesters' religious aspect, because they believe that this is this is part of their their right to practice Christianity the way they, they, they read it. The family's right to bury their, their child in peace. Yeah, that's, that's part of it too. The religious, no, let, me, let me stave off the, the religion questions. The Supreme Court never really looked at the religious issue. That was not part of the, the uh, matter that was actually litigated. So the pure issue here was whether 
this right to protest is legit because the father and the family invoked tort law to protect their rights. I know we got a couple of lawyers in the room. Anybody want? Anybody know what tort law is? No. Criminal. Um, if I recall correctly, please correct me if I'm wrong. The Snyder family, whose son was killed, sued. Mm -hmm. um, sued um, the Christian group and in a lower court won like four or five million dollars worth of damages and because the, the church of course didn't want to pay that money it went up to the Supreme Court. Yes, yeah. so yeah, that's the procedure. What happened. what happened here, the family ended up invoking tort law. Tort law is our basic body of civil litigation. Saying negligence, Slip and falls, right? The heavy. You watch, if you watch any local TV, you see the heavy hitters. <laughs> the heavy hitters are all you need. Yeah. Well, those guys are tort lawyers. They they get hired by people who slip and fall, people who have medical malpractice problems, uh, somebody if you, who gets hit. There's a whole body of law based on holding people civilly responsible. And the way we, in this country, the way we hold people civilly responsible is by suing them and collecting money from them. Okay, to be perfectly cynical about it, that's how we hold people accountable. Of course, you can be held criminally accountable and go to jail, but uh, that's also not that easy to do either, even for people who do break the law. So, in private settings, if you want to remedy a wrong, you can bring a civil lawsuit based on tort law and essentially collect money. Well, that's what the family did here. <coughs> they brought a civil lawsuit against the, the, the reverend, and they ended up collecting a, about $10 million. A jury believed that the harm caused by this protest was worth $10 million. Wow. They didn't collect it. They didn't collect it. They didn't collect it. No, they didn't collect it. Because during, again, the procedure all into this, when you appeal a case, you, hold, you, you, you get the court's permission not to pay out, essentially. You get the court's permission to hold off any judgments until it's finalized. So the $10 million was never paid. They never had to, they never had to write a check. Okay. Yes? Um, I was wondering, um, did it come up at all that they could have protested other, in, in another place, assembled, assembled in another place besides right outside the... Uh, if they had the right to assemble, uh, maybe they just chose a poor place to do it. <laughs> well, it's a, when you get yeah, but does that come into consideration when they when they talk about those things? Maybe some of it's a factor that a jury might consider when when assessing the, the, the damages. But it, I mean, it, it didn't matter if they were across the street or you know a half a mile down the street. Mm -hmm. The fact that they were doing it at that time and that sensitive moment was. Uh, was the basis for the lawsuit. Mm. Now the tort that, that the family involved here was uh, this complicated tort called intentional infliction of emotional distress. Not an easy, not an easy cause of action to, to collect on. It essentially requires a plaintiff to prove that there was either an intentional or reckless action <coughs> that was outrageous that caused severe emotional distress basic tort law. Every state has its own version of it, and it's sort of a hurt feelings tort. Somebody hurts your feelings, and you have some sort of physical manifestation where you can't sleep at night, or you have stomach aches, or headaches, or things like that, because they've upset you so badly. You've been so upset, you, you can't rest, you can't sleep. It's not an easy tort for a plaintiff to, to collect on, especially when you deal with media or somebody else's right to express themselves. And the Supreme Court's ruled on this in, in a First Amendment case that goes back to the late 80s involving uh, Reverend Jerry Falwell. I'll get to that. I'll get back to that in a second. I'll get, that's one of my favorite cases. It's uh, one of the highlights of my semester when I get to talk about Falwell versus Hustler magazine. Yeah. I didn't bring the ad with me, so we're not going to have it. <laughs> I got to draw the line somewhere with the offensive content. Okay, so we understand a little of how this 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 case 
rose up from the, the lower levels. You've got a pro an offensive protest, upsetting a family at a, at a particularly sensitive time, and we've got a body of case law and, st and, and, and common law that allows parties to protect their rights. Right? You do have a right to be left alone, especially at a sensitive time. You have a right not to have your feelings hurt by offensive behavior or offensive speech. But we also have the First Amendment. So we've got this complex nucleus of, of issues with all the electrons floating around. I don't know physics, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. We've got a lot of things going on here with this, these competing interests. So how do we deal with it? Whose, whose rights are going to be held up on the balance? Right? We know that the Lady Liberty and the Justice symbol with the, the, the scales and the balance, whose rights do we, do we uphold? <coughs> How many people are offended by the, by the speech? By the protest. By the protest. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Except the protest was not at the cemetery, and they didn't even know it was there. They watched it on TV after the fact. Okay. So, the, so because they don't, they didn't know about it. It's okay. Well, it's not okay to get ten million dollars. <laughs> they didn't get ten million dollars. So they what? They did not. They did not end up getting the ten million dollars. Yeah. Okay, that was okay. I would think it would be vaguely similar to rushing up to a radio or TV reporter who is covering a fire, jumping in front of the camera and spouting a political view. Um, Am I right or wrong? But it seems that they're using a profound event as a chance to gain a forum. Yeah, definitely. definitely. But we've seen that with a lot of other French groups, too. We saw that with the, the, the reverend down in Florida who wanted to burn the Koran. Yes. Yeah. And um, he ended up doing that, didn't he? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so, something like eight or nine Americans died because of it? Well, if you can make the causal connection, congratulations. I, I... <laughs> well, and, and I, 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 I think in Afghanistan or something, some Americans were captured and killed, and the people said very specifically, it's because that reverend burned the Koran. They yeah. grabbed the first American they could see and killed it. Yeah, well, it's adding gasoline to a fire that's already burning out of control anyway. Oh, yeah. But that, that reverend belonged to a really, really small church. I don't think they had more than 100, 120 members. But now the whole world is talking about this guy. The whole world is talking about him. So I think you, you, you make a really good point about, you know, how do you make a big name for yourself now? Do something crazy. You see it every day with celebrities. So... Well, I, I would say this had this ties into the control of, of the uh, media because much of our media in this country and, and, and I think in the Western world now is controlled more and more by, by lar very large corporations, some international corporations. Mm -hmm. And sensationalism was always a part of, of, of uh, uh, I think, print media and, uh, and other mass media. And it's become more so. And, and politicians uh, capitalize on events also to, to bring attention because that's when the media is focused on something, that's when they can get an interview in. I don't think it, I, I think characterizing it as fringe groups is ignoring that everyone else jumps on something when it's current for the same reason because the media will cover it then. So I think it ties into freedom uh, of the press, which we have, but we don't have because a lot of things aren't covered, and the only way to get them covered, if, if you are an advocate, is to do something that you feel the media will cover and hope that it will, because we can't, most of us can't afford our own uh, newspapers, and, and, and though we, there is, with the internet we can do a lot more, it's sort of a given that a lot of people aren't gonna see whatever you put out unless some, some of the larger media outlets are covering it. So it's, it's a very big dilemma, I think, for, for, for all democracies and all those who, who believe in informed public. Yeah, I mean, we do have our problems with the privately held media in the United States. 
but it's still a privately it's still a privately held entity. Who runs the media in Syria <laughs> or Libya or Iran or the former Soviet Union? I'm, I'm kicking back. Who owns the media? Those well, places? It often it's government owned or else owned by government companies. Yeah. But we have the FCC, which at one time regulated the media and has had lost much of its yeah. enforcement over the years. Yeah, the, 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 FCC only, the, the FCC only regulates a narrow segment of the media. It regulates correct, correct. broadcast television, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't delve into content other than indecency and obscenity. I'm thinking of equal to when we had the equal time provision. And that's out the window. So that, that's been that's been valid. But that, but again, that was a legitimate government policy at the time because there were only three to four, maybe five TV channels in any given market. And you said it yourself: the internet equalized a lot. You well, were, I, don't, I, I wouldn't say equalized. It's just it's op it's opened it's up all different ways. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, it's opened up opportunities for people to have access to media that they didn't have. Ten years ago, um, broadcast media, being as they were using a public resource, the airwaves, were obliged to operate in the public interest. And years ago, public access and community reporting of news and so on, it it was implied and required uh, that if you're going to have access to the airwaves, then you have to do this, whether you make money on it or not with deregulation, what well, news rarely if ever made money uh, in the broadcast business. And nowadays, uh, free from the constraint of doing it, they are um, turning to <coughs> sensationalism uh, to turn it into entertainment. Yeah. I'd like to point you back to newspapers. <laughs> I'm a newspaper guy. Right. I'll take you back to newspapers from you know, 1900. And you don't get more sensationalized than those newspapers. The government wasn't interfering with them. So yeah, you, it, it's, mar it's market driven, whether it's the best system out you know, that, that, that we could ever design. You know, no system is going to be perfect. Follow up? Oh. Oh. Please. I, I'd like to just to go back to the case because I want to clarify something in my own mind. Mm -hmm. You were saying that the that the original protest was not actually visible to the family that was down the street or something like right. that. So it wasn't as though it, the media, the way I read it, sounded like it was totally in their face. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot more offensive than down the street. But even down the street, their intention was to say that the death of this soldier was a punishment from God or something, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. whatever they were more or less applauding, you might say, the yeah. death of the soldier. Yeah, that's, that's accurate. Okay, even though that, it, well, I'm glad to know they didn't work right on the doorstep. You know, that's what the media seemed to say. So, close enough. We wouldn't let, it get a, let a good story get in the way of facts. <laughs> it happens. I was a reporter. You, certain details do get shed from things from time to time. But, yeah. If the demonstration destroys property, do you still fall under the First Amendment? No. I mean, again, there are limitations to the First Amendment. You don't have a right, you don't have a First Amendment right to destroy property. You don't have a First Amendment right to trespass. <clears throat> You don't have a First Amendment right to defame somebody, to say something false and harmful about somebody's reputation. You don't have a First Amendment right to infringe on a copyright. You don't have a First Amendment right to publish something obscene, whatever that means. That's a whole nother lecture, guys. So, I mean, there are limitations. There are limitations. But there are extensive protections depending on what the kind of speech is, which gets back to what you know how Chief Justice Roberts wrote about this case. Because this was speech on a public issue. Whether you agree with it or not, this was speech on a public issue. I'll come back to that in a second. Please. I just had a question about this this Phelps. Now my understanding is that with this this church that there's a a group of bikers that 
show up at all? Were they there? Did they not get close to the funeral because the, well, the bikers, bikers were there blocking them? Yeah. yeah. Now they they said they stayed away because um, um, they, because there, there are laws in many states now that require you to stay X number of feet away. Although this law really was this Maryland at the time didn't have this law in play. So they were staying far enough away that they weren't going to be in their face, but they were staying close enough that people driving up there would not. Okay. So uh, you know, 44 states and the federal government now have laws on the books that prohibit protesting at, um, at funerals. As a, as a result of this case? Um, some of them are as a result of this case, yeah. Is New York one of the 44 states? Yeah, New York has, has a law. Because I know, the reason I asked about the religious aspect of it is because funerals do have protocol and respectability uh, criteria yeah. for the rest of the people that are involved, such as you know traffic and that, that type of thing. So. Yeah, the law, the, there's a law in the books that says you can't disrupt a religious service. And you know, that happened a couple of years ago around here, actually, at one of the other synagogues in town where some. Some nuts came in and wanted to protest. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you don't have a First Amendment right to disrupt a religious service. So there are laws. Did they have a permit to assemble? And if they did, was there an early warning that they were going to assemble and why? I don't think they got a permit, but I don't think they needed one because they were on a public, public part of the street. Still, sometimes need a permit to put a view over a certain number of people. Yeah, they, but they weren't in a they weren't in an area where they were going to need. It wasn't like town square or anything like that. But I, they didn't get a permit, and I don't know if they needed one in Maryland. Correct. Does the does the media have a responsibility? Um, I'm, I'm sure that somebody says we're going to be protesting. Um, does the media have a responsibility to to alarm the the, the authorities? I would say no. I mean, there's a huge body of case law involving media and confidential sources. Uh, you know, like the deep throats in the parking lots, uh -huh. giving you know, giving Nixon and giving uh, Woodward and Bernstein their their envelope of documents. Okay, there's a whole that's what we call confidential sources. But there's a whole body of law designed around whether reporters should have the right to operate with uh, confidentiality. Because the risk of that, the risk of, of, of breaching that confidentiality is that reporters become a branch of government. The well, reporters become an investigatory branch of, of the government. They're informing the government of, of knowledge that some law is going to be broken as opposed to a secret that's going to be passed for, you know, whisper. That's, that, that's a common, I mean, that's a, it's a, it's a common ethical dilemma that reporters and, and editors face in really narrow circumstances. And you know, reporters and the media are you know, they're bystanders. We're there to tell the story. We're there to report for other people. When I was a reporter, I never felt like I owed government any obligation to tell them what I was working on. And I was once nearly subpoenaed to reveal my notes on something. And the, you know, the DA had called me and said, well, why do you want my notes? I put the best stuff in the story in the newspaper today. What do you think, I left the good stuff out? <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and then I, and he, this guy was a level-headed guy. He didn't, he didn't want to start picking a fight with, with uh, the newspaper. But every now and then you hear about reporters who get subpoenaed, you know, come, ordered to, to, to appear before a, uh, a tribunal, usually a grand jury, that operated secrecy. <laughs> with the sole purpose of rooting out who their sources are. And editors and lawyers for the press wave the First Amendment around and say, well, look, we are not a branch of government. We are an independent entity. We have the independence to operate without government uh, looking at our notes. And that's a huge, huge issue. That's a huge element of, 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 uh, of our independence under the First Amendment. Because you can't, you, you wouldn't be able to trust the press if they were sitting there reporting, you know, calling the government first before uh, they went to press or went went on the on the air or, or on the web. 
So this, this concept of independence from government is, is important. Independence, but again, independence from government is an independence from corporate entities. Okay, but pick your enemy. You know, is it a corporate? Do you, would you rather deal with a corporate, a multinational corporation owning a newspaper, or would you rather deal with a monarchical family that owns a newspaper in your town? That if you get on the wrong side one day, you're never going to get in the newspaper, except if you've been arrested. I mean, I can, I see benefits to the old days with small, family-owned, independent media, and um, I see benefits of having big corporate-owned media, too. Although, when you're answering to shareholders, um, they're more interested in the bottom line, and you see things like investigative reporting and in-depth stuff going out the window. Right? Do you see the economy um, creating a more conservative approach to policy? And, uh, properly referred to as governmental standards and a shift in more conservative and stilted um, view um, that people have more constraints on their ideologies and it's just that um, when you read the newspaper it just seems like everything is so exaggeratedly outlandish. What newspaper is he reading? Well, you know, it's just they're just extremes. And, you know, it seems like the economy is really creating a shift in, in policy. Things are certainly being tested. Yeah. Um, yeah if we want to look for a culprit for the extreme in, in, in um, rhetoric now, I say I blame cable television. You got your Fox on the right, yeah. you got your MSNBC on the left, and you got CNN trying to figure out which way to go. Right. And, and you see that sort of uh, spilling over into, into uh, other branches of media. I mean, all these TV stations also have websites. All these newspapers have websites. And um, you, you, see people, you see these media entities trying to figure out how to get the biggest audience. Because the only way they make money, it, it, there's a myth out there, they make money from newsstand sales. That's a myth. That's 10%, 15 20% tops of a newspaper's uh, revenue stream. All the money for a newspaper comes from advertising. All the money for a TV news operation comes from advertising and commercials. Your advertising rates are, are, are dictated by your circulation numbers. Your TV rates are uh, are dictated by your ratings. That's why I think we're at sweep, sweep sweep right now here uh, locally. Because Channel 9 is doing a, an investigation on private investigators. <laughs> here, I'm, here I am being a show for Channel 9. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it costs money to do that stuff. And you, you make money. And it, the, the press is a business. If you go back and look at the Constitution, there's only one business mentioned anywhere in the Constitution. And that's the press. Right back to our First Amendment. No other business. So, and in order to, to, to fill the newspaper, to fill the, the 22 minutes, actually the 10 minutes between the, the weather and sports, <laughs> you know, it costs money. Reporters cost money. Journalism costs money. Independent journalism costs money. So, um, you know, I, I think we are at a crossroads because the revenue stream is different now. The business model is different. And, you know, we, we are living in a time of extremes with the rhetoric. And the, the blurring of opinion and news. Right? You watch... MSNBC from, I don't know, 6 at night to, to midnight. And that's not news, folks. That's opinion. Right? Anderson Cooper isn't quite news anymore. Uh, the, the, the crack pots they have at Fox. Now, O'Reilly is not a newsman. Right? That's opinion. And there's a role for that. I mean, there's certainly a role for that. But we... We sort of get lulled into this this concept that we're watching a news channel, therefore it's news, when it's really probably just the news we want to hear, the viewpoint we want to hear.
Well, you know, the, the context on the internet, which is so easily obtained um, everywhere all the time, is so dry that the, uh, the television or radio media, if they're not uh, explosive, then they're not useful. So uh, the internet has created the, the need for O'Reilly to be loud and, and boisterous. Yeah, although he doesn't need an excuse. Oh, well, he, he is, and, and the reason that he's he's got uh, viewership is because he's as opposed to the internet, which is just plain cut and dry. You know, the news comes across all the time as a streaming page after page. It's just black and white on the internet. Well, and and you know, you've got to search for it on the internet. You've got to search for the news you want to look at. But you can. Yeah, and you can get Google alerts. You can you it can get sent right to you. You can tailor certain news sites to the exact news you want to. You want to cover, you want to, you want to view, but um, you know the, to get to get noticed now, you got to do crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. the people have always done crazy stuff. Um, while we're talking about the media, it seems like the print media is moving towards magazines, and it seems like you're getting more factual information in the magazines because they're taking their time to write those stories. In the newspaper, the story has to be written and it has to be on the press within hours. <coughs> and this way they're doing it. And, and take Syracuse, for example, uh, there are several inserts in the local newspaper. They have the Green Magazine, the Health Magazine, the Money Magazine, mm -hmm. all of those which are different from what we're accustomed to in reading the news. Yeah. Well, the lines are blurred now. I mean, when I was a reporter, I would file my story at 7, 8, or 9. I'd press send on the computer, it would go, and then I, there was nothing I could do about it. If there was a mistake in that story, I just had to bite my nails all night and hope that a copy editor might catch it, and then you know, pray that the next morning that nobody else catches it if there was a mistake. And then I could fix it the next day. Um, so there was this dead, dead zone. So if something happened after you press send, you couldn't fix it. Okay, that's old media. Now, there's a 24-hour news cycle, and that just means the news is always happening. It can always be changed. So newspapers are, you know, yeah, you're right, newspapers are producing more content that's like magazines used to. But every magazine now is running a website that's updated up to the minute. So every, it, it, you know, it's all, it's all upside down. Everybody's doing the same thing. Now, TV stations are now, they all have websites, and they're writing content like newspapers. Mm -hmm. The world's crashing around us. I don't know how, I don't know how reporters do it now. They have to do everything. It's exciting. What do you think about Wikipedia and the issue of freedom of speech? I think it's a great resource to express yourself, and I wouldn't spend two minutes looking at something on Wikipedia. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you why. I, I, have a, I, have a, I used to work with a guy whose son was a uh, student at a prestigious Midwestern state school uh, who on the weekends would get drunk with his buddies, go on to Wikipedia and rewrite things just for fun. Anybody, Wikipedia's an online encyclopedia that anybody can write something for. Anybody, if you register, you can write something on it. And it's great. It gives regular people an opportunity to contribute to our body of knowledge. But it also allows regular people to contribute to our body of knowledge. <laughs> How long would those edits last? What was that? How long would those edits last? Um, I have no idea. See, that's a, sorry, I, I, I'm a defender of stuff like I mean, you don't use it for your, your research papers, but if you're looking up, like, who was in the movie with Kevin Bacon or something where, it, you know, if you get the answer wrong, it's not that big a deal. You know, there's a difference between using Wikipedia for your, your research material and using Wikipedia for random fact checks. And stuff like that, I mean, yeah, you can edit it, but how long do those last? Usually they don't last very long because there's people who volunteer and comb through it and, you know, and it's dependent on, like, okay, so Joe Schmo at Ohio State, whatever, you know, XYZ State, makes an edit, it's not given as much weight as someone who's spent 10 years editing Wikipedia, that person, you know, will greatly trump the, you know, the person who's just, you know, fooling around. 
Sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm a great defender of it. I, I mean, it's not research material, but... But it, people, but people use it, it for research material. Which is ridiculous, and you know, you also check on the references. You see if certain <coughs> articles have, you know, a lot of references, and then you can give that article more weight than something that has, you know, nothing in it. It's just someone typing. The references are, the, uh, I agree, the references are the valuable part of Wikipedia, if they're legitimate links and yeah. things like that. But, uh, yeah, you know, if I saw that in a college research paper, I, I cringe. I yeah. do cringe from time to time. It's not what it's for. <laughs> no. right. You spoke of the um, the press being named in the uh, um, First Amendment. First Amendment. So how has that, if at all, changed with the advent of the internet and what's now, like you say, the magazines posting daily in the newspapers? How's that changed with the uh, First Amendment or? the Constitution, or is it going to change? It's changing every day. Um, you know, the biggest, the first wave of, of internet litigation, lawsuits involving the internet, focused on this concept of where you bring the lawsuit, these jurisdictional questions, because where is cyberspace? If anybody can tell me that, I'd really like to know. It's everywhere. It's everywhere and nowhere. So there's an entire body of complicated <coughs> procedural law on where you bring your lawsuit. Well, we're, if, you, if you're somebody who's living in California and you've been defamed in a newspaper and a website in New York State, where do you bring that lawsuit? So that was the first way. A lot of procedural stuff that still gets litigated every day. Stuff that's really not that, you know, it's not that, it's not that sexy, it's not that interesting. It's, you know, lawyers get all juiced up about it, but it's sort of procedural and boring. The bigger questions are how we define certain things legally with the internet. The biggest thing now is how we define opinion. Because we talked about certain, you know, our, our limitations on, 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 on the law based on, on the First Amendment. And this concept of opinion, protected opinion, is an important concept that's got a huge body of law based on old technology, newspapers and magazines, letters to the editor, opinion pieces. Right? There's protection associated with that when you want to voice an opinion, and you can tell it's an opinion. So, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty uh, low-key in class. I, I'm pretty easygoing. I, I often allow my students to have one shot at defaming me in class. Free shot. It's an exercise. I, I hunker down and I deal with it. But. It's hard to do when you think about it, because so much of the stuff that could be interpreted as defamation would be opinion. So you can say, I'm stupid. Right? Government's stupid. Maybe I am. Okay, maybe I'll agree with you on that. Okay, but that's your opinion. How do you prove that I'm stupid or not? How do I prove that you've harmed me, you've, you've published something false and defamatory about me? But if you call me a criminal, that's a different story. And you can't just slap, I think, on top of something and get away with it. So I'm sort of simplifying this concept of opinion because it, there's the case law on it. It's really, it's really difficult to get your hands around. But going back to the end, the reason I'm going there is because the internet is so imbued with opinion. It's all you see on the internet. And you know, the, 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 the greatest area where we see this is this concept of blogging. Whatever a blog is. Has anybody ever read a blog? Has anybody written a blog? Do we have any bloggers in the room? Rabbi, you blog? I do a video blog. Have yes, you defamed anybody in your video blog yet? <laughs> Not that I've, I'm aware. Well, he could argue that I defamed Haman at Purim. <laughs> He's a bad man. And you can yeah, make a case So. He's lying to prove. So, but you know, the blog, you know, blogging isn't quite news, but it's not quite opinion either. So there's going to be a huge, there's going to be some definitive case law in the next probably five to ten years, helping us figure out how we view this. Because you know, when you read something on the editorial page, that it's an editorial, that it's opinion, that it's protected. It's not something that's for the truth of the matter asserted, a pure fact. It can be proven yes or no. Right? Back to my criminal example. 
I'm either a criminal or I'm not a criminal. There's not a lot of wiggle room there. I'm either a cheat or not a cheat. A liar or not a liar. Stupid, not stupid. Well, that's your opinion, and you can you, know, you can write your notes to me later on, or shoot me an email on that. So, yeah, the, this, this, the internet's ripe for this discussion. Ernie. Uh, with respect to uh, current uh, situation with respect to WikiLeaks, mm -hmm. uh, now that is a real hassle with respect to confidentiality and things which have been uh, distributed with respect to so-called secret documentation that the government has, which all, <clears throat> all of a sudden popped up on the internet. Now, the, the, they seem to have zeroed in on at least one person who's responsible for this and looks as if they're going to take the gentleman and put him away forever. Your comments? <coughs> You're all familiar with WikiLeaks. This is this massive dump of classified government documents, presumably leaked by this private man, who's now in a military uh, um, um, a military jail in, in Quantico, Virginia. Uh, he had access to classified military documents, raw data, raw field reports. He gave them to this this goofball in, in England. There's Julian Assange, who's Australian. Australian, but he's living in England. Uh, was in the, process being, in the process of being extradited to Sweden, where he may or may not have committed sexual assault. And it's like, it's like a regular soap opera with this. And he, public, he, he facilitated the publication of this, these secret documents by the New York Times, by uh, a German magazine, by an English newspaper, and then a bunch of newspapers and magazines all over the world. So the question is, do you have a First Amendment right to publish content that somebody else broke the law to get to you? That's, that's the media question with that. Do you have a First Amendment right to publish something that somebody else broke the law in uh, acquiring? And the answer to that was answered by the Supreme Court in '71 with the Pentagon Papers. With, uh, and, and, you know, I have the I have the honor of having Daniel Ellsberg. I saw a couple of people in the room with the Ellsberg speech back in in March. The man who leaked the documents to the New York Times back in the early '70s. So there's a whole body of case law based on reporting elements and you know somebody else breaking the law. Now. You know, the question of whether the source is private manning, well, he's in trouble. He's in hot water. And he, he probably does not have a First Amendment right to break the law to reveal information. Okay. So he's in a lot of trouble. He probably will spend a lot of time <coughs> in jail. But that, again, the use versus the break. Those are, those are two different issues. But uh, it's fascinating stuff. If you've read any of this, it's fascinating. And it really does you know, show the strength of our democracy that these classified materials do get le you know, are leaked and out there for public consumption. But you know what? Government services are still operating. Nothing's been shut down. There hasn't been any violent revolt in the United States. Our troops in, in the war zones are going to be targets no matter what is released in the media anyway. Well, is it effective intelligence gathering? You don't know. I don't know. They don't. That that's classified. I mean, nobody's nobody's going to tell you that. I can tell you, back in '71, after the Pentagon Papers was released, you know, the top secret military study on uh, Vietnam War. Well, that didn't that didn't damage any national security interests. Ellsberg says it himself. Even people who were involved in the government years later have said it really didn't damage any, anything. But we might never know. All I know is I can't read enough about Gaddafi's uh, uh, Ukrainian nurse. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fascinating stuff. I mean, these, are, these are the military documents that were released in the, Wik the WikiLeaks dump. Uh, you know, Sar you know, President Sarkozy's Insecurities. I mean, it's fascinating. But 
that's what I mean. But that's what that's what we're that's what we're reading about. I mean, a couple last week, the Times had a, a whole series of stories on all the prisoners in uh, Guantanamo Bay, little profiles about these guys and their daily <coughs> habits and what they're doing. It's fascinating. I mean, that's all a result of the uh, the WikiLeaks uh, stuff. But um, you know, it's the strength of our democracy that we can weather this this uh, this uh, content and still operate. I too am concerned about um, testing our democracy, the conflict between the freedom of speech and defamation of character goes out right here in this community when we have public forums and people defame the character of an elected official. And one example that just keeps sticking in my head is when President Obama was speaking to Congress and a member of Congress screamed out, you lie. How do you balance the right to speak out on defamation of character? That's what we spend a lot of time worrying about. Yes. Defamation of characters is saying or publishing something false about somebody that causes harm to their reputation. That's the nutshell of the tort. When you're dealing with people in government or public, either public officials or public figures, there's an additional burden of proof that the plaintiff has to prove that it was published knowing it was false. This concept of what we call actual malice. So you have to know it was false when you published it or said it. Um, and that's a, that's a difficult burden for uh, a plaintiff to prove. And uh, every now and then, you will see a public official or a public figure bring a lawsuit. And it's legitimate on this concept. And it's the ultimate balancing test. The, the right to express yourself, the right to publish, versus the right to keep your, your reputation healthy, strong, untarnished. Again, losers take their cases up to the, the, the higher courts, the appellate courts, with the purpose of having it overturned as a, body, as a matter of law, that it doesn't comport with our standards. Okay. So it goes to the Supreme Court, and Chief Justice Roberts writes the main opinion, the majority opinion, an eight to one vote, eight to one voting to overturn the civil judgment against the church. Okay. And the other, you know, the frame it the other way. An eight to one vote to allow these protests to go forward <coughs> with protection because it's a public issue. It's a matter of public interest. That this speech is important because it deals with public issues. Even if we don't agree with it. Even if it's, as the, as the Chief Justice said, morally flawed. At best, if it's a morally flawed judgment. Uh, morally flawed opinion, uh, protest. Who was the dissenter? Was the, the dissenter was Alito. Oh. Well, it is Alito is a conservative justice, and he's not a big fan of speech, free speech. Okay. Uh, it goes back goes back to his confirmation hearing. His confirmation hearing was uh, contentious. Remember, his wife ran out crying and. Um, he didn't really agree with it. Uh, Justice Breyer concurred in the opinion. He is sort of in the middle and nowhere, in no man's land when it comes to speech issues as well. Okay. Do you think that there's anybody currently or um, soon to be uh, popular for only their internet reporting as compared to the individuals who write for the Times or um, magazines that are celebrities, but just internet only. Um, I mean, there's some publications that are internet only. There's some you know, a couple the individual of reporters, or I don't know anybody off no. hand. Is you know, just a, a, I mean, a, a pure web-based reporter. I mean, Matt Drudge got a, a lot of publicity in the '90s, but he's not really a reporter. He's just a sort of a tabloidy kind of guy on the internet. Uh -huh. So, yeah, I can't think of anybody off hand. Uh, can you go back in history? The First Amendment is actually an amendment to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. When was it enacted? And who of our historical figures 
was behind it, put, actually pushed it. Right. The Bill of Rights was, was part of the negotiation between the Federals and the Anti-Federals. Right. Guys like Jefferson and Madison read the, the first draft of the Constitution and said, well, this is great. This is a great blueprint for the government, but what's in it for the people? But right. if you read the basic part of the Constitution, Article 1, Article 2, Article 3, it's really just the blueprint for how our government is structured. The legislature, the executive, the judiciary. There's nothing in there for the people. So there was this big compromise, and that's where the amendments came in, 1791. Okay? And when you look at and James Madison wrote the First Amendment. He had uh, the heaviest hand in uh, the Bill of Rights. Okay? With the purpose of providing something for the people. So when you think to think back to what we consider our civil rights as citizens, First Amendment, free speech, religion, press, assembly, petition, government. Okay? These were rights that were not afforded to the citizenry under British rule, under colonial rule. If you wanted to run a newspaper back in the colonies, what did you need to get? Permission. Permission. A license. A stamp. Remember the stamp act? Remember all that? Well, that was real stuff. I actually have a colonial newspaper that has a stamp on it. The stamp had a twofold purpose. One was to prove that you had the license, and one was to collect the taxes. Okay. So if you wanted to have a newspaper, you needed to get permission by, from the government. And if you needed to get permission, then you needed to adhere to their rules. And, that, and, and, and the rules were you couldn't criticize the government. And the government then, and they had this body of law called seditious libel. So you couldn't criticize the government. And the government meant you know, the parliament, meant the king, the queen, the royal family, and the church. All right? The royal family. I would have been in a lot of trouble just in the last couple of weeks with the documentary wedding. Okay. Do you realize that this temple is on Madison Street? Yeah. Yeah. Named after James Madison? Yeah. Maybe. I don't. I don't. I, we have to check the history on that. That's why you remember, isn't it? Huh? I can walk here from home. That's why. I remember. <laughs> um, but I mean, it, 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 and, and you think back to the other rights we have under the Bill of Rights. We've got. You know, I know somebody mentioned the right to bear arms. Well, you couldn't have a gun back in colonial times. Now, the second, I'm not a Second Amendment expert, but the Second Amendment of 1791 really bears no resemblance of what Second Amendment rights are to that. But things like, you know, right of certain freedom from search and seizure, where the you know, police can't just come up to you and shake you down without reasonable suspicion. But these are the, the basic rights. I think one, one point uh, we might want to ponder, this whole topic tonight is very interesting to us as, as citizens, and it, 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 it tends to make the U.S., our democracy, seem better uh, than, has, than exists in, in other nations. But there's another aspect of the freedom of, uh, of uh, speech, and freedom of press, which, which, is, which is a little less comfortable for us to talk about, and that has to do with, with as a Jewish community, our relationship to our communal institutions. We have a Jewish community newspaper, which has limitations on speech because it's privately owned. We have organizations such as this synagogue, which can choose, due to their board of directors, who they invite and who the, they don't invite. And I think, which, which is the way it should be. But I think as a community, these are things which we, in a democracy, an open democracy, we would be talking about a little more, and we wouldn't necessarily be accepting uh, on face value any board of directors' determination which direction they want their speaker series to go, or which direction we want our Jewish community newspaper to go, or which way we want our federation to limit who we hear and who we don't hear. And I think that's a little less comfortable for us to talk about because it's much closer to home and it brings up some controversy and divisions which may exist. But I think a healthy democracy is one which knows how to respect each other's opinions and is 
willing, as long as it's not defamation, and not, as long as it's not violence and destruction of property, to hear different points of view. And I think that's something which doesn't get talked about as much because we tend to focus on, as understandably in a way, what's going on in the, in the public sphere, where we're all a part of, and the private sphere is, is sort of set aside. And that's not to say other institutions don't have similar similar dilemmas, the Catholic Church or, or any church or any, or SU for that matter, has, has issues of freedom of speech, which we also don't tend to air as much because they're more difficult. But I think that's part of a healthy democracy and why some would argue in a way we have a democracy on one level, but on, on other levels it's less so. And I think that's something maybe we want to talk about sometime. Talk about it any time. <laughs> Again, you know, private institutions versus you know, government action are two different things. And whether uh, certain certain practices fall on fall into the spirit of free speech and the spirit the spirit of the First Amendment. Uh, I deal with that every day up at a private university. So I mean, you, you're on the money on that. We have time for one last one question. more question. What do you think about the zero tolerance in the schools? You know, children can be suspended pretty quickly for writing, drawing, things that look threatening. I call it the Columbine impact. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's another cutting edge issue right now. Where speech ends on the internet, uh, how, how far we're going to go with <coughs> defining what we would call a true threat or, a, you know, or an, 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 an issue of incitement. Or there's a clear and present danger of some imminent lawless action. That's the Supreme Court's language. And I think too many school districts are a little too eager to uh, call and, you know, send people to detention or throw kids out of school because of what's going on off campus and Facebook. Um, schools are, are touchy right now. And I mean, I can understand some of the issues, but too much off-campus conduct that wouldn't qualify for uh, legitimate suppression. But I'm not a school principal or school district uh, supervisor. So, uh, one more question, Rabbi? Yeah. Sure. Um, where does obscenity come in? Obscenity is illegal. But what do we mean by obscenity? Obscenity is is legally defined. Legally defined obscenity is, is content that an average person of a contemporary community finds uh, taken as a whole appeals to a prurient interest, right? Graphically sexual content that also lacks literary, political, or scientific value. So, uh, you know, a couple of bad words here and there would not rise to the level of, 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 of obscenity. Uh, something that we would consider graphic pornography, which again, I use the term pornography <coughs> delicately because that's also a term of art as well. Uh, what we would consider graphic hardcore pornography in certain circumstances might be considered obscene. Again, might. Uh, the Supreme Court has been uh, pretty uh, delicate with giving us a three prong test for determining whether content is going to be obscene and therefore bannable and censorable. So uh, I wish I could give you a, a firm answer on that, but even the Supreme Court couldn't give you a firm answer. <laughs> so. Uh, I thank you for coming tonight. Thank if you, you have fun. Uh,